Okay, so welcome to another difference space um, class. And today we will talk about homogeneous spaces, which is, uh, let's say, the first example of a very useful uh, difference space. And for that, we will need to talk about Bessel functions. So, um, so let me just, before I start, let me just make a quick definition. What is the homogeneous space in the sense, in the way the Burns defines? So, um, so a homogeneous, um, the Burns space is, uh, satisfies that, uh, um, let me copy here. So A1 plus nu F to AC belongs to the different space whenever um, F is on the space. Um, and then see, let's see, you, you only need to assume A between zero and one. And has the same norm. So for every function you get on the space F, you can make this a scaling and you get another function in the space. And this other function has the same norm as the, as the initial one. So that's the definition of a homogeneous Zebron space. And if you go to, uh, so this is stuff in chapter 50 from the book. And then the branch shows that he completely classifies these spaces and he shows that, um, well, first of all, you can, it's, it's not hard to show that nu has to be a real, I mean, I'm saying nu is a real number. Nu has to be a bigger than minus one. Um, and so there's an exercise for you. Um, and then he completely classifies this, this spaces, uh, saying that modulo some natural isometries, that is one of them would be modulo multiplying the function e by some uh, complex number. So you have to put things right and normalizing the function by removing a zero at the origin, if it has one. Another thing you can show also is that uh, from this definition, you can show that nu has to be greater than minus one and e has no, has no zeros in um, the real line. So it possibly can have a zero at the origin. So modulo uh, removing that zero, let's see, dividing by some m and multiplying maybe by a complex constant, it completely classifies the space. I'm not gonna do that because that requires what is called model space uh, theory or canonical systems of differential equation and et cetera which we didn't cover in the course. I'm just gonna show uh, uh, how to build them from scratch. Uh, and then, uh, but what I'm just trying to say is that um, the way I'm gonna build them now uh, is actually the only way. And you can actually show that any space that has this property here is model some symmetries is the space I'm gonna build in this class. Okay. So to build spaces satisfying, oh, and before I go on, for instance, the Paleo-Vina space is homogeneous with nu equals minus a half. Because when you, when you do a scaling like that inside the L2 norm, maybe I should write, when you do half of X squared, that would be the norm in the Paleo-Vina space. Definitely you can do this and then multiply by an A. So if you take, Square root here. Okay. Um, 
what you have here, you can move this A to the inside. So now you have a function which has the same norm and is also in the space and with nu equals minus a half. So maybe as a note here, the P within the space, uh, let's see, it's exponent two, it, it is uh, homogeneous with nu equals minus a half. Okay, so another way of creating an homogeneous space, maybe before we continue, uh, is well, you can play the same game and then maybe put a power weight here, something like uh, uh, some constant a dx, not a because uh, let me say alpha. Then you could do the same, you could just do a change of variables and you put a here and the a to the alpha would be to a true alpha here. No, sorry, would be a uh, a to alpha plus one, sorry. Dx, oh, model line of x, alpha. Dx, and then you can move this a to the inside. So the alpha plus one over two squared. Am I doing this right? It looks right. Alpha dx. So if I want alpha plus one over two to be one plus nu to maintain the notation, then I need alpha to be two nu plus one. So if I go ahead and replace from the start, plus one dx, that would be two, uh, a to two nu plus two. And then I can move it to the inside as nu plus one. And that will, will be exactly what we define. Okay. So another way of cooking uh, an homogeneous space would be, oh, let's say I just put this norm here in the space with this power weight. And that would fulfill this condition because here is another function with the same norm as the initial one. And uh, actually that's the only way, that's, that's what the branch shows. That's the only way to do it, to put this norm like this, okay? But to, to, to make this right, to construct these spaces, uh, you need to talk about best of functions, okay? So let me erase this thing. We will see that again. So, so this class will also be nice because I think, because you will learn some things about Bessel functions that may be useful in, in other areas and other stuff you would do uh, moving on in your career. Okay, so what's the best of function? So let's start with uh, the most straightforward definition. So the best of function is a function of the variable, complex variable Z defined in almost all the complex plane by a certain power series. And in this class, I will only work with nu greater than minus one. It's a real number greater than minus one, but you can define for other values. It's just a slightly uh, tricky definition, but anyway. Um, and also in this class, whenever I do factorial of a real number, this guy could be a real number because it's m plus nu. So whenever I do a factorial, let me Let's see, if I do alpha factorial, 
this is just short for gamma of alpha plus one. Okay, so alpha factorial will be defined for every number alpha greater than with, with real part greater than minus one, for instance. Okay, so this is the, the definition, and this, this function is called. Um, uh, so maybe I should even say, so this is guy is called the Bessel function of the first kind. There are three kinds. We only see the first kind, but the first kind in the off order. No. Okay. And this is well defined because, well, we have this power here with this real number. So we have to take a branch and define, uh, we have to take a cut in the complex plane to define the log and so to define the power. And that branch cuts is when you remove the negative uh, real numbers. So this is always defined with the argument. Okay, when you, the argument is never uh, either minus pi or pi, which would coincide with the negative real numbers. Um, and, and zero as well, of course. Um, so, so there you go. So you have your best function will define. It's not how it was built up historically. Historically, it was uh, a power series uh, solution of a differential equation. It's the Bessel differential equation. Um, which uh, this function, which this function satisfies. Um, let me write in these terms, pz squared j plus Okay, so the solution is j equal j. Okay, so so one way to come up with this with this formula is just to try to solve this equation here by power series, and you will see that there will, there must be some recurrence relation with the coefficients. You solve that recurrence relation, and you get this power series. Some examples: um, we have the g minus a half. And with the j minus a half, if 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 you remove this uh, um, the square root of z, it will be the opposite of this two over z because it's minus a half. Then you get this series here. Factorial. Oh, and there was the two here. It's also two to the two to the m. And then you use a binomial identity, uh, which I'm going to write here maybe. So the binomial identity. Whoops. The binomial identity you use is um, two to the two to the m m factorial m minus a half factorial equals equals two to the m factorial and then minus a half factorial but minus a half factorial is square root of pi so when you use this then you get two over pi z sum of m equals zero to infinity of minus one z two to the m divided by two to the m Factorial, but this is nothing but pi z cos z. Okay, which is nice. Uh, so, is the cosine is the cosine function, and similarly we can do z over half, and you can show that this is two uh, over pi z. 
sine of z. Okay. So it kind of recovers the 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 functions we know, uh, and in general, you can show. You can show that if you do this, as long as n is an integer and this number here is greater than minus one, so n could be minus one, but not minus two, for instance. So uh, let me put here for n greater or equal to minus one. You can show that this is uh, square root of two of a pi z some e to i z, some polynomial of degree n, one over z plus e to minus i z, the polynomial star. When you change all its coefficients by the conjugate, one over z. Okay. There's a generalization. So, okay, so these are the best of functions of the first guy, more or less, you know, the differential equation, and you know that the defining power series. Um, okay, let me do the integral representation. Let me show the integral representation. So, it, so it'd be useful to have an integral representation. Uh, by the way, any questions so far in these definitions? Okay. So can, how can we come up with an integral representation? So usually when you have a power series like this, and this is maybe a nice uh, thing to keep in mind, nice tool. Uh, when you have a power series like this, to come up with an integral representation is useful to use the beta function. So the beta function represents, um, so the idea is to use beta function. Okay. Because the beta function dxy, which is defined as x minus one factorial y minus one factorial divided by x plus y minus one can be shown to be equal to the integral of zero to one of t to the x minus one, one minus t to the y minus one dt. Okay. So this will transform your, let's say if you have some kind of a binomial coefficient, some factorials like we have here, you will transform this thing into an integral and then you can summate inside the integral and then you come up with some integral representation. So let's do that. Um, so first of all, you, you see that, well, by the definition, if I multiply both sides by z over two uh, raised to minus nu, I can cancel that uh, problematic part here and multiply this part. And then I end up with the power series that converges everywhere. So then I end up with an entire function. So z over two minus nu times this function. This is now an entire function by the power series representation and it is of this form. This is two to the two to the m, m factorial m plus nu factorial, m from zero to infinity. And in here we could do more or less the same trick we did before, we use the same identity the same identity we use here, except that um, we use it only for this part. So this little part here will be this guy divided by that. So then we use this um, and then we get out some numbers. Oops. 
you can have a mon is a half factorial, you can have a new, oh, and then I'm, and we will leave some space, but I will include some other stuff here. And then I have C2M minus one to the M, then I get this 2M factorial here. And then I get a M minus a half, the total coming from the identity we just used, divided by, divided by M plus nu factorial. So this has just used the identity, and now I'm going to multiply and divide by nu minus a half. Okay, so this is m from zero to infinity. Okay, so I just use this guy here and then multiply divide by nu minus a half factorial. And now you have here exactly what we have for the, the beta function, except that the x would be, I guess, a nu plus a half, and the y would be m plus a half. Okay, so then you use that to so use the beta function representation. And what you get is one over whatever, there's this constants in the front. And then you have the sum in M over Z two to the M minus one to M factorial and integral from zero to one of t m minus a half, one minus t um, nu, yes, one minus t, what is this, nu minus a half. Let's see, let's, let me see if I did it right. So it looks like, oh no, I'm choosing the opposite way. I'm choosing a y equals, um, Nu minus, I'm choosing y equals nu uh, plus a half and x equals m plus a half. And then replacing this formula. So then I have m here and nu here. Okay. Okay. So then what we do next, uh, then now I can put the sum inside because now the sum inside the integral is just a cosine because I have this guy and then times t. So then I can put the sum inside, summate, and then you can show that it converges and you can, you can do that, you can commute. And then what you get is cosine of z square root of t one minus t nu minus a half dt divided by square root of t. Okay, just passing the cosine to the inside. Now we'll do a change of variables. We replace, let's say, s equals square root of t. And then we will get a true here on the outside, cosine of sc one minus s squared nu minus a half. And in here is zs, it should be two ds. Because that's why there is a two here. But since this thing is even, I can put from minus one to one to look at more symmetric. And now let's put the numbers we have got here. It's minus a half factorial, nu minus a half factorial. So there we go, you have a, um, you have a, um, an integral representation. And what is nice about this integral representation is that it writes this function, which is entire, as the Fourier transform because there is a cosine here. This cosine can easily be replaced by e to the i s z because the sine part of the exponential will vanish because you have some even thing here. 
So you're writing this as the Fourier transform of this function, which is supporting the interval minus one, one. Thus, what we see, we see that this function here is real entire. It's real on the real line. Well, this power series is telling that it's real on the real line. And of exponential type, exactly one. Because, well, this guy, the support of this guy is exactly minus one, one. So therefore it's, uh, uh, it's of exponential type one. Uh, what else? Oh, but one thing you have to notice is that this integral here can only converse if this number is greater than minus one, which means that I have to assume for this integral representation that nu is greater than minus a half. Okay. Um, and what, what I'm what I claim here, and, and let me put in parents, and for minus one less than nu. Well, if it's a equal to a half, equal to minus a half, the end point, then we know what it is because it is it is a cosine function. Okay, so when I multiply by square root of a of z, I just get cosine, which is the entire function of exponential type one. Okay. And then for this bit, you have a, there is, there is another, which I'm not gonna show, there isn't, there, there are other integral representations that show the same. Okay, so bottom line, uh, this guy here is real entire and of exponential type one whenever nu is greater than minus one. Okay, any questions too far? Okay, so, um, so I'm, we're almost ready to define the De Bruyne's, uh, the, the Hubert uh, uh, hermit Biller function to define the De Bruyne space. Um, I just want to, want to mention another fact before we start. is also known, no, I'm not going to prove that, that this function j nu of z has only, maybe I can even put this guy here, real zeros. Okay, so it doesn't have any other zeros, okay, uh, other than real ones. And these are called the Bessel zeros. And usually you see the notation like this, little j, uh, maybe nu n, okay. And usually people only concern the positive zeros because if you take a look, this function here is actually even because it's power series only well, has even powers. Okay, so this is an even function. So you only need to know the positive zeros. And, uh, and this guy also doesn't have a zero at the origin because of its, uh, well, because of its integral representation, if you put z equals zero here, it's going to be one, so this is going to be non zero. And the other integral representations for nu between minus one and minus a half also show that. Uh, 
Okay, so so for now on, I will define. So for now on, I will define a nu n to be j n nu if n is greater than or equal to one and minus j n nu if n is less or equal to minus one and at zero, it's not defined. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay, so we have only real zero. So now we can define the Dermit beta function. So uh, I will use, it's not needed, but I will use the normalization that the Bruns uses in the book. So inu would be, you have this extra new factorial here, minus nu, and then you pick j nu of z minus i j nu plus one of z. Okay, and nu is some number greater than minus one. Okay. Okay. I will define these guys as a nu of z minus i b nu, the usual decomposition with you. Okay, so you can figure out here by the expression what a, a should be this guy here times nu factorial and b should be this bit times that. Okay, so what you can say about a and b, okay, you can say that a is even because, well, it's just this part times a, a, a normalization, we just saw it's even, but um, nu plus one, you're not multiplying by the full minus one here to make this guy even. So actually multiplying, there is a missing z, so therefore b is odd. Is odd. Uh, what else do we know? If you look at the differential equations that the Bessel function satisfy, this is another calculation exercise, you can deduce a system, a differential equation for these two guys. And that's what it is. Have to divide by z here. Well, since b is odd, there's no problem. And so this is the differential equation. They satisfy. And all of these are just uh, some boring calculations. Um, you can evaluate a at the origin also. It's one, and that's why the Brown's takes this normalization to make it one at the origin. There's another reason why it takes the normalization. Uh, also, if you do E star Z, well, that is just uh, A nu, A nu plus I B nu, but this is just A nu of, of minus Z because B is odd. And then, then this minus here will, will, will be, become a plus when you pull out the minus from the variable here. So nice, we have a function like this, um, what else? And also the main reason is that if you do E minus a half, that is the function defining at the Taylor Wiener space. This is I minus I Z. And that was the De Bruyne's function that defined the Taylor Wiener space. So conveniently, when you put nu equals minus a half, you get exactly the Peter Vina space, which is exactly one of the examples of a homogeneous space. So great. So it looks like we create a family with this nu, and at the right spot, it, it gets the correct function. Uh, 
for the arms of so P minus zero. Zero. So the right way of interpreting this, guys, and whenever you are in doubt how the, the things are working, just think of A to P cosine and P to P sine. Okay. It even works better for A because when you differentiate A, you get minus B, which is exactly what you have for when you differentiate cosine, you get minus sine. And when U equals minus a half, this bit here is zero. So when you differentiate sine, you get cosine. Okay? When U is not a half, then you have this correction. Minus a half, sorry. Then you have this correction. Uh, what else you can say? Oh, we also have a... Um, Hadamard factorization. Well, E is even, A is even. So we have some, so maybe some constant H and the product of the zeros. And it has to be like this because, well, A at the origin is one. So there is no constant, uh, different constant factor here is of exponential type. So there is only some linear guy here and the product of the zero, since the zeros are even. So if you have a zero, you have a minus the zero, there's no exponential here as well. So it's a nice clean other amount of factorization. And similarly for B, you have like a, let's see, a U, Z, but then you have an extra Z here because it's odd. But the rest is the same. And now this is nu plus one because that's the defining function for B. Okay. So have, we know a lot about these functions. Um, so now I wanna show that, uh, well, and one thing you can deduce from here well, once you have this Hadamard factorization, like this, it has to be like this. And this guy has to be real because these functions are real on the real line. Uh, so then you conclude that this function all have only real zeros and has a Hadamard factorization like this. So they're both of Poya class. Because that's exactly the factorization of a function of Poya class. They even, this is called what, this is what is called Laguerre Poya class to be precise. Laguerre Poya class would be functions of Poya class that have only real zeros. For some reason, uh, it, it seems like Laguerre studied the functions with only real zeros and then Poya studied the ones we learned in the class. Okay. Any questions so far? So the claim is that inu is a function, is there a meet be a function? Okay. Um, so how can we show that? This is actually a generic fact. Whenever you have, let's say, A, and this is one of the problems in the book, which is on the final list. It, whenever you have A, which is a, which is a function of Poya class, and then you define B by just this differential equation, then you end up with A meet with the function. Okay, so let me show that. It's actually a one line proof. So if you do e star of z is squared, nu of z squared, let's say um, z is, so let z in the upper half plane. So I have to show that this ratio here is less than one. So we just open the squares in terms of a's and Bs. Okay. 
since you have a star, then a, a, E star is A plus IB. So that's why there is a plus in here. Okay, but then you replace by this, you say that E nu is minus the derivative of A. So then this guy becomes a minus. And I put here A nu prime. This becomes a plus. And I put A nu prime. So if this real part here is positive, then the numerator is less than the denominator. And this would be less than one. So is this less than one? Well, this would be less than one if and only if the real part of i in nu bar in nu prime is greater than zero on the upper half plane. But it's definitely true because the real part of i d bar a nu prime is just, let me remove that. A nu, and that is what we, we often use as the derivative in y of the log of the moduli of e of a, okay? But a is a function of poly class. So it's non-decreasing when you go up. It's actually increasing when you go up in the in the in this direction because uh, because otherwise, if it's not well, there is a problem in the book that says that it has to be an exponential, uh, but it's definitely not an exponential because it has zeros. So this bit here is greater than zero. since a nu is of Poya class, okay? And you can see by the proof, it's a pretty general. So that's a way of building uh, a remit Biller function. You just pick a function in the Laguerre Poya class, say, and then it's put as the B function minus its derivative. And there you go, you have a remit Biller function. And in, and in all situations and applications, that's how we, usually build these guys. Any questions here in this proof? Okay, so right now E can have some real zeros. It doesn't, but right now there's nothing avoiding it to have real zeros. Uh, I will answer in part that now it's a modern known fact. Asymptote. You need to know some asymptotics of Bessel functions, which I'm not going to show again. But it's known that we have that common factor, 2 over pi z, which is the same that appears with the cosine when this nu was an integer plus a half. And not surprisingly, not surprising, there is a cosine here in the asymptotics. It's a certain translation, but that's not the problem. E plus O of one over Z. And this O is uniform as long as you are in a compact set inside the region, uh, minus pi. Actually, it could be a cone, so. So it could be something like, so this holds whenever Z goes to infinity and you are, let's say, in this part. So you avoid this, this bit, okay? So the constant here in implicit could, it will go up when you, when you approach this, this bit. Okay, uh, is that the, yeah, that's the thing. Um, so when you multiply, that's, yes, that's the thing. Okay, so, so then from this, so this is a known thing. I'm not gonna show this requires some, it's not hard, but it requires some time. Uh, but this shows 
So you can use that to see what happens with E of Z, let's say when X is real and X is going to infinity. Well, if you divide by new factorial, which is the terms we have and divide by X over two to the power minus nu, that would be just G nu of X minus I G nu plus one of X. And recall that E nu star is E minus nu. So I only need to know when X goes to plus infinity, not minus infinity. Anyway, this would be, if you put these two together, because this guy and this guy with nu plus one, we have a, a, a shift here in this thing. So you have a cosine and that shift will produce a sine. So you have like a cosine minus an I sine. So this would actually be two over pi z, e to minus i z, and this, uh, and this translations, which I don't care, plus some O of one over z. Okay. So bottom line is that e nu of x in model i behaves like and this is my symbol to say that it's bounded from below and from a, and by above by a constant, multiplying constant. Let's say for moduli of X, let's say greater, very large, let's say greater than some value. Okay, well, simply because, well, if you take the moduli of E, this is, has moduli one on the real line, oh, this is supposed to be X, sorry. It's supposed to, to be X. This bit here has model I1. So if we move this guy to the right, um, if we, no, sorry, if you, if you take this asymptotic here and just consider the taking the model I here, when you take this model I here and send the X to infinity, it's converging to one because this has model I1. So then you get this. So if X is pretty large, then this holds. So, so this in part eliminates the possibility of E having real zeros, at least uh, outside a very large interval. It could have still some real zeros close to the origin. It won't have, uh, and this will be part of the result we're gonna prove actually. Any questions here so far? I know it's a bunch of information, but uh, uh, it's not that, I would say it's not that complicated, but if you see for the first time, then you can have some uh, uh, questions. So don't, don't mind asking. Okay, let's take the theorem. By by my, it should be theorem L by my uh, way of numbering, labeling theorems. Um, so let H nu be the space of entire functions. F of exponential type less or equal than one in such that the normal when I put in the space, which will make it a, a normed, uh, a, a, a Hubert space with an inner product is going to be well, exactly as I told you in the beginning. Such that this is finite. And again, nu here has to be minus one, greater than minus one. So space of, so imagine like the, 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 the paler Venus space, the paler Venus space for the space of entire function of exponential type and most something such that the L2 norm on the real line was finite. 
The only difference now is that I'm putting a weight, okay? Then H nu is a de Brown space. Space. H nu is actually equal to H associated with this function E nu. Because if it's a de Brown space, then you have to tell me what the function is. Okay, there is a definition of the Brown space that only satisfies three hypotheses, then it's at the Brown space and you know that there is a, a function associated. But what is that function? The function is the function in you. Okay, then how do norms relate? It's actually the isometry between the norms. Something very nice. And the constant is this guy. And because of the normalizations we did, turns out that the, the, the normalization actually pops out. Okay, so this is the theorem. So we now have an example of the modernized Brown space for these power weights, and they're built using this Bessel function. And this identity here, at first time, can look weird because usually when you have something like this, let's say in a space that would mean that this function has to be equal to one over that function. This is not the case. Um, if you think a bit more about it, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that since because these functions have, in a sense, um, spectrum supported in an interval, it just means that the Fourier transform of this bit should be equal to the Fourier transform of that bit. Um, in that interval, um, in, this, in some way. So it's not the case that this is equals to, this guy is equals to one over this guy squared. It's just that this thing, this identity holds uh, uh, for every function in this space. Okay, so the proof is not that hard. There is just one it that requires a sort of counter integral. And I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna refer to a part of a book that does it. It's kind of boring, but uh, other than that, uh, the proof is not that hard. Okay. Um, let me prove that. So step one. So step one would be, well, let's prove that if F belongs to H2, then F belongs to H of E. Before I even do that, let me just verify that this space has all what it needs to be a De Bruyne space. So to be a De Bruyne space, it needs to satisfy three conditions. The first condition, maybe not in the correct order, but the first one would be that the functional that takes F to FW is continuous. And you can actually show this with this norm, okay? Not gonna do it, that would be the hard part. The second part would be that if F is in the space, then F star is on the space, it has the same norm. Obviously that's, this is always going to be true whenever you have a norm on the real line. That's why this condition is there. F is on the space and F star is on the space and has the same norm. That will kind of force the norm of the space to be in the real line. So this is given. And also if, if F z is on the space and has a zero at the point W say, then you can cancel that zero, put the zero, the conjugate and that function still has to belong to the space and has the same norm. Again, whenever you have a norm of the real line that will be given as well. 
because when you evaluate this guy on the real line, it has model I1, so you are not going to change the norm. So the only, uh, let's say, difficult part would be to prove that the functional is continuous. And also would be to show that this norm here is um, complete. I think the completeness shouldn't be that hard once you have that the functional is continuous, uh, the evaluation functional. So that would be only the, be the hard part. But you also can, uh, you can circumvent this thing, just avoid this whole thing, just by showing that if you have a function here, then you have a function there, and if you have a function there, you have a function here, and the norms are more or less the same. So, so let's do it, okay? So suppose you have a function here um, in H nu. Well, then I have to show that it's, it, it's there, okay? Uh, so how, how, how can we show that? So I have to verify the conditions of this space. But we know that E nu being A nu minus I B nu, and these two guys are of exponential type because, as I mentioned, that once you normalize the Bessel function, it will be a function of exponential type one. This guy is of exponential type equal to one. You can actually show it's equal to one as well as the functions A and B. And also, if you integrate the log plus of that guy, That is finite, and this is because because of the boundary showed that e nu of x basically grows like minus nu minus a half. Okay. Then we can use Krein's theorem. That uh, e nu and e nu star. A function is a bounded type in the upper half plane. Okay. And the same trick can be used for f. Now we leave it as an exercise. Also, if f belongs in h nu, is already of exponential type. And since this thing is b finite, you can show. Is not hard. To show the same condition. This person be more than So that again, by Krein's theorem. F and F star or bounded type. Okay, so now to test if F is under the Brown space H in U, I have to test if these two functions are of bounded type, which now they are because each one is a bounded type, F is a bounded type, E in U is a bounded type. Great. And now I have to compute its mean type, but the mean type of f over e nu should be less or equal than zero. But they're both a bounded type, so it's just this. Now, Krein theorems also say that the maxima of the mean types of f and f star is the exponential type of f. Okay. So if I take the maxima of these two numbers here, it's going to be the maximum of these two, which is going to be less or equal than one, minus this guy. Okay. But this guy is one because the type of E is the max of nu of E. And, you, and I'm dropping the index here 
for a moment. Maybe we do that also later. Is the maximum of these two, but since E is our mid pivot function, the function E beats the function E star in the upper half plane. So this number here is larger. So this is just nu of E. So we know that the type of E is one. Okay, so this is just nu F minus one. This is just nu of F star minus one. So these are both less than equal than zero. Because the maximum of these two numbers, again, by Crine's theorem, let me even write it here. Is less than equal than a type of F, which is less than equal than one. Okay. So, okay, so that condition is satisfied. And also, is the integral finite with respect to E, is this thing finite? Well, obviously it is because E has this behavior, okay? Let's say outside a large, uh, a big interval, which is okay because, well, F is definitely integrable. F is continuous in, in, in any compact set. And E, uh, again, E doesn't have real zeros. Okay, um, yes, so, so I, have to, I, have to sh I have to assume that. Um, um, I show that E is a remit pivot function and also, so maybe let me go back. I have to, I will have to assume here. Um, power of the gear, remit pivot function, um, and no real zeros. And the fact that it has no real zero has to do also with the theory of, I just didn't want to mention that, it would be one more thing. But anyway, um, the fact that it doesn't have real zero is also from the theory of Bessel functions because the, vec the, the zeros of this guy and this one interlace. This is also a theorem in, in the theory of Bessel functions. So whenever, so if, if you're looking for real zero, then it must be the case that this guy and this guy vanish at the same point. And this is not true because the zeros of these two guys interlace. So whenever you find two zeros of that guy in the middle, there is a zero of this guy and vice versa. So that's why it doesn't have real zeros. No real zeros because the zeros of G nu and G nu plus one interlace. Okay, so we have to do that. And then I will, we can go back and then you can ask the question again, is this thing finite? Yes, because this one doesn't have real zeros. So if we put the capital T here, this will always be finite. And at, when X is very large, E behaves like this. So, so, um, so another way of saying that would be the model i of x to two nu plus one behaves like e to the power minus two. Okay, so it behaves exactly like the the weight we put here, so that's why it's finite. And it's finite. Okay, so now we have to uh, do the converse. Okay, but the converse is more or less the same. So let me write here. F belongs to H nu, then it implies that F belongs to H nu. This is uh, more or less the same. And why is more or less the same? Because, well, suppose that this is finite. Well, we know that nu f is of bounded type. Well, because f integrates against this, which by the same reason will imply that this uh, is finite. So f is of bounded type as well. So, um, 
So if I want to measure the exponential type of f, uh, well, the integral is finite, of course, because if this is finite, and uh, so, so that's finite. So I only need to check the function is of exponential type less or equal to one. But since f and f stars is of down the type, I just need to check that the maxima of the mean types is less or equal than one. But we know that these things are less or equal than zero if f belongs to the pale of in, to the, sorry, to the De Bruijn space in nu. But this equals to that, which is equal to that. So then we know that the maximum of the mean types is less or equal than one. But that is the exponential type. Okay, so the, the, the going back is more or less the same. So everything here is, is due to the crime theorem. It's a very important theorem. Any questions here? Okay, so to finish, we need to show that the norms agree modulo a constant. So we need to show that this, and I would drop the 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 enu for the moment. It will be implicit. The new parameter. Let me call this star. We need to show that this is true. for every uh, F and G in H nu. Let's say in H of E, since I dropped the, the subscript. Okay. Um, great. However, since the spaces, uh, I only need to show this for let's say a orthogonal basis. If I have a orthogonal basis on the space, if I show this for the orthogonal basis, since it generates the space, then this holds for every F and G in the space. So, but using the asymptotics by the Bessel asymptotics, um, a, neither B, I will take A, doesn't belong to the space, okay? So, K, the reproducing corner of the space, K, uh, let's say, A, N, Z, for N uh, different than zero, this will be the best of zeros, um, uh, is a orthogonal, basis of H of E. Okay, this is again another, so we're using several results here. So this is again another one of the important results. I mean, this, this is the basis, the space where A n and the zeros of A. A n are the zeros of A. Okay, which will correspond to the best of zeros. So I only need to show, so I only need to show star for F and G equals say uh, K A N Z. Let's see belonging to this set. And that simplifies things. So let's assume that F is some K-A-N and G is some K-A-M. So let's uh, deal with the case N different than M. Okay, so the left-hand side, so let me put this in red. So star would be this guy. And the left-hand side of star is what is C 
integral from minus infinity to infinity of k a n x k a m x r divided by e x squared d x. This is just some constant c a n a m. But this is zero because this is exactly the inner product of these two of the functions in this orthogonal basis. So this is zero. Okay. So the left hand side is zero. What's the right hand side? So the right hand side then we have to use uh, the formula for the reproducing kernel and see what it looks like. And I will do that fast. It looks like this. And then it will be integral from one is infinity to infinity of ax squared divided by these two zeros. And then this guy. Dx. Okay. Um, we have to write the formula for the reproducing kernel in terms of a's and b's. One part of it will vanish because it's a zero of a. Then you have this function a popping out and with this constant constants multiplying. Okay. Then let's go back to the Bessel guys. So this would be um, d a n d a m over pi squared. And then there we come out this new factorial two to the new squared. Or maybe I should go to the new page. Um, and then um, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of j nu of x a moduli of x, say, x minus a n, x minus a m, and moduli of x dx. Why I'm putting moduli of x here? Because, well, this function here is even, so I could put moduli of x here to start with, and then I replace everything by the Bessel, uh, writing terms of Bessel. So this guy was what? Was, was, was a z to minus nu times the Bessel function which will cancel with this two nu. So there will be only one moduli of x. And th there is the normalizing thing to the outside because it was set over two nu, uh, two to the minus nu. So there is a two nu multiplying everything. Okay. And now we can further decompose this integral. So let me put this as L divided by a n minus a m. L will be this, this constant here. And I'm using a partial fraction decomposition here. So that would be j nu modulo of x, then x minus a n, or oh, there's a square here, of course. Uh, modulo of x. Uh, yeah, let me put inside the same integral. And that would be what? Um, mod moduli of x divided by x minus a n, and then moduli of x divided by x minus a m dx. Yes. And then let me continue a bit more. And then now this bit, let me integrate the first bit, this guy first. Well, if I integrate this guy first, I will have, let me write here. I will have something like moduli of x. Let me integrate from zero to infinity. So you have from zero to infinity, x over x minus a n, and then minus the bit from minus infinity to zero, which would be x over x plus a n. So when you do that, you cancel the squares, you get a 2an 
x divided by x squared minus a n squared. Okay. So if I replace this thing, this thing in here, I will have zero to infinity, j nu of x squared, and then two a n x over x squared minus a n squared. And then if I do the same thing for the other, I have minus two a m x divided by x squared minus a n squared dx. Any questions here in this comp computation I did? Yeah, great. So, so there we go. So that's, that's, that's the final formula. And then I will, this is the part where you have, you have to evaluate this via counter integral, which I'm not gonna do it. So there is a counter contour integral uh, argument. Uh, and this is on the book of Watson, which is the Bible of Bessel function. Watson is said a treatise a treatise in Bessel function, I guess. And it's 13.53 equation four. And he shows that if you integrate this thing on some r squared dx, so just like we had, this is actually pi i over two. Maybe I should put this. This is pi i over two, g nu of r, and something, this something else is what is called a Bessel function of the third kind, which I'm not going to define, okay? So this is a Bessel function of the second kind, and you put them together, it becomes the third kind. It doesn't don't bother about it, it's just another function there, okay? And this holds whenever the imaginary part of R is greater than zero. Good. How can we use that? Well, this guy is real. So the imaginary part is not zero. What you can do is a simple approximation argument. You just make the imaginary part great, greater than zero just by replacing a n with let's say i epsilon. So the imaginary part is positive, then you can use this formula. This formula will be available and then you send epsilon to zero. So this implies that the integral g nu of x, x, a n is just a Bessel zero. So let me write here, divided by some Bessel zero nu squared, this is zero. Because then we have to evaluate this guy at r, which will be zero and this guy at r. This, this part doesn't matter, okay? So this is the counter integral that I don't wanna do with. But anyway, any questions here? So bottom line, there is a black box that I don't wanna do. And it shows that this bit, so is zero. So right hand side of star, is zero because what we do is just a difference of two of these those things and both is zero. Okay, what happens if they're not equal, if they're equal? So let me go back. If they're equal, then you're gonna have here a n a n with a constant. Okay, so the right hand side of star should be a constant k of a n a n. You can figure out what that is. This is a prime of a n b of a n. And because of the differential equation, we have a, um, a prime equals b. This is just c minus b, sorry, b a n squared. So that's the right hand side. The left hand side of star, let me go back to the computations. All this thing here is still the same. 
we get B A N of B A N squared here, which is nice if A N equals A M. Everything is okay up to this point here. I can't do this partial fraction decomposition anymore because A N equals A M, but I can do a trick. What I can do, I use the trick set epsilon equals zero, a n equals a n plus i epsilon, and a m equals again a n, but i two epsilon, say, so that they're not equal and they have positive imaginary part, okay. So imagine whatever I put on the right, I just is is actually the thing evaluated when epsilon equals zero. So in, if in the end I get an expression that makes sense, then this whole calculation makes sense. Okay, so I can proceed and I can just copy this thing here. And put it here. And now I'm not gonna do it. So now you can use the formula because a n in this in this bit here, I should stress this thing, a n is just actually this, um, I shouldn't say this, I should put tilde, let's say in everything so to be completely rigorous. Okay. And then you put epsilon equals zero. But now you can use the formula. Okay, so the formula would tell you uh, that this thing is L divided by A M tilde minus A M tilde, and then it's pi i divided by two. And then it's what the formula is here. Let me put this thing here. Reduce just a little bit so you can see the formula. This is this, and then the first bit should be what? 2AN tilde, and then it should be J nu of AN tilde times J nu of AN tilde plus I nu of AN tilde, and then minus something similar, but with AM tilde. Okay, and then you're going to evaluate when epsilon goes to zero. Okay, that's okay because this thing here is what is like uh, I epsilon. Maybe you should put the opposite. I two epsilon. Let's so this would be a n minus a m. So this would be I epsilon. So the i will cancel, and this will be pi over two divided by epsilon. And this bit minus this bit at epsilon equals zero vanishes. So then you just have to compute the derivative of this thing. And then we left a review to compute. Uh, in the end, you will deduce that this is uh, uh, two to the nu, nu factorial squared two over pi. It will not depend on the a n. And I mean, it will depend on the a n, but just the thing coming from L. So C equals to and then and so that finishes the proof. Okay, so basically, just a quick review, uh, we, to show the identity, which is the most amazing part, you have to show it for, um, for every function in the space that the inner products agree. But then to do that, you only need to focus in an orthogonal basis because A is not in the space. So therefore, I can use the zeros of A. Um, and the fact that A is not in the space because the Bessel asymptotics has this cosine. So it has a, a, a function that oscillates. Um, so therefore it's not gonna be integrable when, once you multiply by this. Um, again, something you have to work out, but it's simple to see. And then when you have two different zeros, 
uh, the left hand side that you want to show that is equal to the right hand side, the left hand side is zero. The right hand side is also zero and comes from a counter integral, which I'm not going to do it. And if they are equal, you can use the same counter integral uh, with a trick, which is this trick here. And in the end, you come up, you, you compute the constant. Okay, so that's the amazing part. And that pretty much finishes what I wanted to say. Um, and this is spaces, just as a final remark, are very useful in applications. Sometimes you have an application in uh, you know, solving a problem in, in a generic the brown space and you uh, have a theorem like this, and then you want to apply for certain occasions. And these power weights are very useful in certain applications in these spaces, like often used um, um, in the theory and, and in applications of the brown spaces. So they are nice to know, and that's that's why I wanted to to build them and and to explain them in this class. Okay, any any questions? Great. So I think we can stop here and see you next Tuesday.